Just got my hands on the brand new 2020 13 inch MacBook Pro, you know, the one that I've been personally waiting for for ages now. Well, almost, that was a 14 inch MacBook Pro. Um, but you see, I'm not actually going to open up this baby, not in this one, not in this video. That's gonna be a separate video, a live unboxing of my first impressions, which I'm recording just after this. So stay tuned for that video. Definitely subscribe and notifications so that you get notified when that video comes out, which should be pretty soon. But until then, uh, I wanna cover not five, not 10, not 20, but actually 25 things you definitely need to know about this brand new MacBook Pro. So get us snacks ready, sit back, relax, and uh, let's take a look. Okay, so first things first, if you plan on buying a new 2020 MacBook Pro 13 inch, Apple actually sells two very different models of it. So if you go on Apple's website, you won't be able to tell which one is which as they both look identical. But as a matter of fact, these two models couldn't be any more different. So the base model starts at $1,300 or 1,300 pounds in the UK, and then the high-end model starts at $1,800 or 1,800 pounds in the UK. So think of these two as the iPhone 11 and the iPhone 11 Pro. While the 11 has most of the features of the Pro, the Pro still has quite a few more advantages over the 11 that gives it that Pro name. Now, since you can indeed select a low-end model and then spec it out so that it ends up being more expensive than the high-end model, the easiest way to tell them apart is by looking at the number of Thunderbolt 3 ports that they have. The low-end model will always come with two Thunderbolt 3 ports, while the high-end model will always come with four. I would say, for most people, the one with two ports, so the baseline, is fine. Uh, but if you're more of a power user and you need to connect it to a 5K monitor, an eGPU, and a few hard drives, then getting that 4-port model is something that I would definitely recommend. Also, if you have the 4-port model, you would be able to charge it from either side of the laptop, which is pretty awesome. The 2-port model has both ports on the left-hand side, unfortunately. Something else that you should know is that even though Apple advertises the new 10-generation processor from Intel on the new MacBook Pros, as a matter of fact, the baseline model still has the 8th generation from last year. In fact, the baseline model is pretty much identical to the 2019 one, with the exception of the keyboard, which has now been replaced by that scissor-style keyboard that we got in the brand new 16-inch MacBook Pro and the new 2020 MacBook Air. Finally, goodbye, butterfly. Interesting enough, both models of the MacBook Pro are now thicker, at 1.56cm thick compared to 1.5 like the previous models were. Fun fact, while the MacBook Air is much thinner, so at its thinnest point it measures only 0.41cm, at its thickest point the Air is actually thicker than the MacBook Pro, measuring 1.61cm versus 1.56cm. Still, while the 13-inch Pro did get thicker this year, it is still noticeably thinner than the 16-inch MacBook Pro, which measures at 1.62 centimeters. And then, fun fact number two, uh, the new 2020 13-inch Pros are actually thicker than the old 15-inch models from up until 2019, which were 1.55 centimeters thick. The thickness increase was made in order to accommodate this new keyboard, which does have quite a bit more key travel. On top of this, the new MacBook Pros are also heavier at 1.4 kilograms compared to 1.37 like we had before. Uh, the MacBook Air, by the way, is 1.29, and the 16-inch MacBook Pro is 2 kilograms. But even though this MacBook Pro did get thicker and heavier than the 2019 model, the footprint, or the size, is identical. Now, when it comes to the keyboard, even though this now uses the old-style scissor switch mechanism, just like on the old 2015 13-inch MacBook Pros, this keyboard is quite a bit different. You see, we don't get as much key travel like we used to, but the keys are way more stable than before. So in a way, it's sort of like the child of the butterfly keyboard, which had literally no travel and just loads of stability, and the old 2015 style keyboards. I personally do like it quite a lot, and I can also type so much faster and so much more accurate than ever before. Speaking of that, if you do a lot of typing, then the MacBook Air might even be a better choice. You see, because of its wedge-shaped design, it is much more comfortable to type on as the keyboard itself is sitting at an angle compared to the straight keyboard of the MacBook Pro. And we also get the dedicated escape key, which is really nice to have, and then the Touch ID sensor is now a bit raised, just like on the MacBook Air, to bring it in line with that taller keyboard. Now, another change that we get is in terms of the trackpad, which is now a tiny bit narrower than on the 2019 models. Um, I'm guessing that they did this in order to prevent accidental touches when typing, so maybe some users have had this issue before, I haven't, but yeah, there we go, narrower touchpad than compared to the 2019 model. Aside from this, we also got double the storage on the baseline model, from 128 gigabytes to 256, which is quite nice, uh, but aside from that, and the keyboard, and the weight, and um, the thickness, 
the baseline is identical to last year's model. Now, the high-end model also got double the storage, by the way, uh, by giving you 512 gigabytes from 256 that we got before. And then you can also upgrade that to up to four terabytes of storage up from two terabytes like we had before. And the two Thunderbolt 3 port model, by the way, this one can only go up to two terabytes. Another difference that you should be aware of is that while the two port Thunderbolt 3 model can be configured up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, the four port model can be configured up to 32 gigabytes of RAM. Now, this is thanks to the brand new Intel 10 generation processors, which do support all PDDR4X memory now. On top of that, while the two Thunderbolt model supports 2133 MHz LPDDR3 memory, the four Thunderbolt port model supports much faster 3733 megahertz memory, which again is also LPDDR4X memory, so it's also more power efficient. If you're into photo editing, that faster RAM would come in handy quite a bit. Okay, but now what about the actual CPU? Is it really worth getting the Intel 10 generation model, or is that 8th generation baseline enough? Well, we actually do get around a 35% faster single core performance on the 10th generation model, which is not gigantic, but it is a fair gain indeed. In fact, the 13-inch Mega Pro with four Thunderbolt 3 ports, even that i5 model now scores higher in Geekbench 5 than the 16-inch Mega Pro and even higher than the Mac Pro. So that's very impressive. If you're mostly into simple tasks that only require one CPU core, in that case, you'll definitely notice an improvement. Multi-core performance is up by close to 20%, so overall we are indeed getting some pretty good gains by upgrading to that fourth Thunderbolt 3 port model. So the real question here is, should you get the i5 or should you get the i7 model of that four Thunderbolt 3 port model? Well, you see the difference between these two is pretty much negligible. And yes, while the i7 can boost up to 4.1 gigahertz compared to 3.8 gigahertz that the i5 can, the i7 also has 8 megabytes of level 3 cache versus 6 megabytes, but the thing is they're both dual-core processors and they're both thermally restricted, so they'll never reach or sustain those boost clocks. Meaning that they're actually way more similar than you would expect. So if you plan on getting the 4 Thunderbolt 3 port model, just stick with the i5. If you plan on getting the 2 Thunderbolt 3 port model, same story here, just stick with the base CPU. Now, something that is a pretty big difference is or are the graphics. So you see, first of all, none of these have dedicated graphics. If you need a high-end GPU for intensive video editing, 3D modeling, or even gaming, just go with that 16-inch Mac Pro instead. Now, while the baseline model still gets the Intel Iris Plus Graphics 645, the 4 Thunderbolt 3 port model gets the brand new Intel Iris Plus G7 graphics which is really the highest end integrated graphics that Intel currently makes. So this one has uh, 64 execution units compared to 48, and it also features improved video encoding. This means a pretty big boost in graphics performance, gaming, as well as video editing. So if you care about any of those, then definitely get the fourth number of three-part model because this one is so much better. Also, thanks to these new graphics and the new 10-generation Intel processor and uh, a slightly tweaked Thunderbolt 3 interface, the four Thunderbolt 3 port model can now drive a 6K display, such as, you know, Apple's Pro Display XDR, while the two Thunderbolt 3 port model can only drive up to 5K resolution. Not only that, but did you guys know that even the new 2020 MacBook Air, uh, which also comes with a 10 generation Intel processor, this one can actually drive a 6K display, whereas the baseline 2020 MacBook Pro <laughs> cannot. So in that case, you might be wondering, isn't the 2020 MacBook Air just better than the 2020 MacBook Pro? Well, not really, and in some cases it actually is. So you see, while you technically get a faster processor and even G7 graphics on the MacBook Air compared to the baseline 13-inch MacBook Pro, uh, the fan on the MacBook Air isn't connected to the CPU's heatsink. So in English, the MacBook Air is like a high-speed car that slows down considerably after two to three seconds just to cool itself down. Uh, whereas the MacBook Pro, even the baseline, doesn't have this issue at all. So for very simple tasks such as web browsing or emailing, the MacBook Air would indeed be better than the baseline MacBook Pro. But once you start doing anything that's a bit more intensive, uh, the Pro will be able to sustain those higher clock speeds for much longer. Also, the Pro does have a DCI-P3 display, which makes it so much better for photo or video editing. And we also have a touch bar, which some people like, some don't. Um, I do like it, by the way, so I'd rather have it included than not have it at all. Now, speaking of that cooling, there is actually a pretty big difference between the baseline MacBook Pro and the high-end MacBook Pro. You see, the two Thunderbolt 3 port model only comes with a single cooling fan while the four-port model comes with two fans. 
So this not only means that the 4-port model will run cooler, but it will also be quieter as those two fans don't spin as fast as that single fan does. So again, if you plan on doing anything that's a bit more intensive, definitely do get that 4-port model. And something that I was very surprised to see is that none of these models of the MacBook Pro come with Wi-Fi 6. In fact, not even the MacBook Air 2020 comes with Wi-Fi 6, meaning that no Macs that Apple sells at its time come with Wi-Fi 6. And instead, they all feature the previous generation Wi-Fi 5 or Wi-Fi 802.11ac, which was introduced back in 2013, seven years ago. This means that you will get slower Wi-Fi speeds than on other 2020 or even 2019 Windows laptops. And what's really strange here is that the new iPhone 11s as well as the new 2020 iPad Pro, they both feature Wi-Fi 6. It's just Macs that Apple decided to leave it out from. Oh, and here is a very serious fun fact. Um, Intel actually embeds Wi-Fi 6 into their 10th generation processors by default, by the way. Now, the chips that Intel makes for Apple are custom made, which means that Apple had to intentionally tell Intel to remove that Wi-Fi 6 functionality from the chips. So my guess is that they've done this in order to keep the cost low, as we do know that Intel does charge significantly more for their 10th generation processors when compared to the 8th generation. So um, yeah, this could be the reason why Apple managed to double the storage that they offered, which at the end of the day, for the end user, I would say it's more important than slightly faster Wi-Fi speeds. And something else that Apple hasn't changed is the camera. We still get a 720p front-facing camera compared to the 4K 60 camera that we get on the iPhone 11 Pro Max, for example. And yes, I know the display of the MacBook is much thinner than you know a smartphone is, but Apple could have at least added a 1080p camera, just like many other Windows laptop manufacturers have done. Now, the microphones and the speakers between these two models of the MacBook Pro are identical. At least this is what Apple states on their website. However, some reviewers such as MaxTech, they did some tests and they found out that the fourth Thunderbolt 3 port model actually doesn't need to have noticeably better speakers. <laughs> In fact, the MacBook Air 2020 now has even more bass than the baseline 13-inch MacBook Pro. Now, if you're considering between the base Air and the base 13-inch MacBook Pro, uh, for most people, I would say just buy the base MacBook Air because that's just more than enough. However, for $300 more, the base Pro does give you a better display that's also brighter and more colorful. Um, you also get a touch bar better performance under load, but the Air is a tiny bit lighter, a tiny bit thinner, and it also has a one hour of extra battery life. So it's just down to what you need the most. Now, if you guys plan on going for that fourth Thunderbolt 3 port model, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Because you see, it does cost $1,800, but the moment you upgrade anything on that, you're already better off just buying the baseline $2,400 16 inch MacBook Pro which offers you a much more powerful 6-core processor, a larger display, better battery life, by the way, as well as a dedicated GPU for a massive boost in GPU performance. So if you plan on doing any serious work in terms of video editing, 3D modeling, programming, or even gaming, just buy the 16-inch MacBook Pro instead. Yes, it is significantly larger and heavier, but you do get an even bigger difference in performance. Now, for me, the MacBook Pro, this one, is almost perfect, almost. If only had a larger 14-inch display and thinner bezels, um, you know, just like Apple did with that 16-inch MacBook Pro. And even though we've seen loads of leaks and rumors on the upcoming MacBook Pro 14-inch, on which we've actually done a video recently, as in a few months ago, um, this is still pretty much the exact same design. However, recent rumors are saying that the new 14-inch MacBook Pro has actually been pushed back to 2021. So if you're on the fence about buying a new 13-inch Pro, it is actually unlikely that we'll see another model this year. And finally, uh, I might actually be switching to it. You see, I don't edit videos anymore, and the most intensive test that I do is Photoshop or Lightroom, which I don't even do on a daily basis. The 13-inch Pro is just perfect for me, especially on the go. The only question is, can it run my 5K monitor plus my 4K monitor setup or not? Find out that and more in the next video and the full review of the MacBook Pro, which is coming out very, very soon. Not a full review, but the next video. We did unboxing and my first impressions. Let me know in the comments what do you guys think about this brand new 13-inch MacBook Pro and what videos do you want to see next on this MacBook Pro? Maybe comparison versus the Air, maybe comparison versus the iPad Pro. Let me know in the comments. 
If you want to get one yourself, feel free to use any of the affiliate links below. They don't cost you anything, but they do help support the channel as Amazon gives us a commission from those sales. Uh, if you want to support the channel, definitely join the zone as well. Uh, you get some pretty cool perks. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, obviously subscribe, hit the bell icon if you want to see more in depth tech videos like this one, hopefully was. But yeah, other than that, I'm Daniel and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. I don't think this is how I end the videos usually. Um, I'm Daniel, Zone of Tech, signing off. Cheers.